Amen. Kept seeing uh, a shofar blower standing up here, so I felt it was about that time uh, for Rick. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ralph to come up and, uh, and Rick Joyner to come up. We're going to have Ralph blow the shofar, and then we're going to extend our hand and pray for Rick. Come on up, Rick. And I'll introduce Rick as well. Just extend your hands towards Rick. Let's pray for him this evening. Father, we're so thankful for Rick Joyner. We're thankful, Lord, for who he is as an instrument, as a vessel, and as a man. We honor you in him. We honor him, Lord. We say, Lord, open our ears to hear all that you would speak through your servant, Rick. Open our hearts wide to receive from you, Holy Spirit. Stir us, challenge us, prepare us, make us ready. We give you permission, Holy Spirit, to do all that's in your heart, in your mind to do. We ask, Lord, Spirit of the Lord, for your anointing, your anointing, Holy Spirit, for you to stand with your servant tonight and proclaim to us the word of the Lord, your very voice. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I first met Rick in 1993. I uh, was living actually over in Charlotte at the time and got to know each other and have become friends. And uh, it's my uh, privilege to welcome Rick and to honor Rick. And I do honor him. And he has ministered deeply into my life many times and very thankful for him. So let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be back over here with you, Terry and his awesome family and friends. And who are the rest of you people? <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, been, uh, got a few things I want to share tonight. And, uh, I think they're relevant to the, the times, and I, I leave to the place, but I uh, wanted to start with uh, sharing with you a little experience I had recently. I think last December when I was over here, I shared about that documentary I was working on with uh, about climate change, and climate hadn't changed. <laughs> but uh, no, it was an interesting experience, and uh, it was you know, a uh, chance to work with some of the best people in the film business. And, uh, but also I really want to understand that about climate change. I don't know if any of you have seen it, the episodes have run on Showtime television uh, over the last couple of months or so. But uh, I think there were nine episodes, but they had different actors and actresses going around and investigating stuff and, uh, it wasn't, in my opinion, a documentary. Uh, I was the only climate change skeptic in the whole thing. And uh, a part of the storyline, which you'll see if you see the episode I was in, they, uh, 
they were really trying hard to convert me. And you know, I was honestly, during a lot of that time, trying hard to convert. I said, you know, honestly, I just said, here's a chance. They said I get to dialogue with some of the best scientists in the world and, and all this. And uh, I said, if there is something to this, I wanna know it. And uh, you know, it is a major issue and it's becoming another major issue of this administration and, and uh, but you know, whether climate change is real or not, and I'm still so skeptical. I had hours and hours with supposedly the top climate scientist in the world, which got cut down to a few minutes. You know, our episode, I don't know, they included 30 or 45 minutes with me and my daughter and all the and actors and all in scientists dialogue. And, but it was really cutting down days and days of taping in different settings and, and stuff. But uh, so, but <clears throat> I came out of it at the end, just as skeptical as I went into it. At one point though, I was totally convinced this is the biggest farce I've ever seen. This, and uh, I think I mentioned they, they finally, you know, after one long day uh, of taping, um, you know, it was kind of frustrating. You know, I just said, look, I'm the only skeptic in this whole thing. I'm not a scientist. Why don't you let me bring a scientist and let's do some taping, do some dialogue in it. Let, let me bring somebody who sees us from the other side. And we tried for a long time to get somebody. Finally, they got the number, supposedly the number one physicist in the world. And, uh, and I thought, well, there, this is really it. Uh, I am a white, southern, conservative, evangelical pastor. They're bringing in the most brilliant scientist in the world to make me look so stupid. And uh, I really thought that's what they were doing. But it turned out not to be that way. But they let me express all of my reasons for the skepticism, which I started with the science. I went to the math, which I do understand. I went to the the politics, to the psychology, and to the hypocrisy of what I'd found in all this. And I went on for about an hour or so with this scientist and Ian Summerhalder, an actor, he had canceled a day of taping their program to come be with us up in Boston, just tape this thing. And, and um, anyway, I downloaded for about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And I said, look, I've got a whole lot more ammunition. I brought notebooks full of ammunition. I said, I've got a lot more on all of these issues. And we can go as deep as you want on any of these. Uh, but is there anything you'd like to say now? This scientist sitting there the whole time just poker face. And he starts out with, yes, I would like to say something. I agree with you on every single point. I said, finally, a real scientist. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the whole point of this thing, in my opinion, was so that people could be reasonable and agree with me on everything. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it was a remarkable last day. Well, anyway, that was very encouraging. I got very close to this scientist and uh, we've stayed in touch. And he is one of the top physicists in the world. But he, uh, he told me one, you know, during that tape, it was like hours and hours. Uh, during one of the breaks, he said, you know, I pray all the time. I said, really, who do you pray to? He says, I don't know. And uh, I said, well, why don't you ask him his name? And I could tell, I don't really want to know his name. <laughs> you know, this is more convenient. But I said, okay, what do you pray? He said, uh, I just say thanks. He said, I, I just... I can't thank him enough. And he told me, he said, you know, I don't believe in faith. I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, I'm a scientist. I don't need faith. I see God every day. He said, I, you can't do what I do and not see God, not see his work. He said, there's, you know, uh, but anyway, truly a remarkable man. But then this is what, really got me. 
you know, they wanted me to go to the premiere with my daughter, and um, they had a few hundred of the, a lot of Hollywood people and the most, uh, the big money contributors to a lot of these causes. And uh, I wouldn't want wanting to go because, you know, I figured nobody's gonna wanna talk to a preacher in this setting. I got in, I couldn't believe it. They grabbed me, they wanted me, they were all wanting me to take pictures with them and their family, the producers were taking me around, introduced me to everyone. They, it turned out our episode became the most popular of all the episodes. But, uh, but then we're standing around, have this huge reception, there are a few hundred people there. And, um, you know, people were just lining up to talk. And I was talking to this one lady, you'd probably know who she is if I mention her name and uh, some other uh, people from the Sierra Club. And I just quoted a scripture to them and I felt the power of God go out. I mean, I felt it go out like I hadn't felt in church in many years. And this one woman jumps back, she goes, I felt that. And this woman from the Sierra Club said, that almost knocked me down the stairs. And I turned around, looked all around the room and everybody's staring at us. <laughs> and I know they felt something. And it just, and I, I felt an incredible anointing all night. In almost every conversation, I felt the Lord there. And, and I went back to my hotel room. We're staying in the hotel that's connected to the UN building there. And uh, I didn't like the whole setting I was in. But I get back to my hotel and I said, Lord, what was that? I didn't think you'd go to something like that. <laughs> and this is what got my attention. This is what has really been a challenge to me. I'm working on it because I know the Lord said it. I said, Lord, I haven't felt you like that in church for a long time. What was that? He said, well, you were with my friends. And I'm thinking, you know, I've learned you don't challenge God. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. And I, but I know I'm thinking, they don't even know you. I don't think there was two other Christians in the whole place. And he said, friends love the same thing. Same things. And these people love something that is very dear to me that not many of my people love like I do. He said, he so loved the world, he came, not just man, but the world. And uh, he said, you know, he loves us more than many sparrows, but he loves the sparrows too. He loves every creature. He loves the earth. And uh, so I've been processing that. But then he said something else that was even far more challenging. He said, you've always thought I had to return lest no flesh survive, you know, which it does say, scripture says, if the Lord didn't return, no flesh would survive. He said, you've always thought that was because of war. And it's true. I never even considered anything else. He said, have you considered this because you're destroying the earth? And if I didn't return, no flesh would survive. I said, Lord, I have never considered that. And then he didn't say that was it. That was the last thing he said. But I'm considering it. Now, this is one of my points. I've always been an environmentalist. I believe Christians should be the best environmentalist on the planet. I mean, the very first command to man was take care of this garden. You know, be good stewards. And somewhere between a third and 50% of all the teachings in Scripture on righteousness are about stewardship and one of you know i think one of the greatest gifts god has given to us is the planet i mean it's so awesome and you know i hear christians all the time well it's going to be burned up there'll be a new heavens new earth you know there was a new heavens and new earth after the flood it wasn't talking about the terra firma the lord god is going to come and dwell on earth among men He's coming back to restore the earth. And as Peter called it, he said, restore all things. And there's something here that we've got to get. 
Now, you know, I, I don't mind hugging trees. <laughs> After listening to Terry today, I'm going to hug a few rocks. He was talking about rocks, you know. But, uh, no, but, you know, this is an incredible gift that God's given to us. And, you know, if we disrespect the gifts, we're disrespecting the giver. Now, I'm not saying run out and become a raging environmentalist. There are so many extremes of that, so many bizarre people, so many bizarre agendas behind it, no question about it. A lot of deception, a lot of uh, stuff. But there is something here that if we don't become salt and light that we're called to be, it's going to continue to be out of whack the way it is. And to go to those extremes, and they, you know, over and over, all night at that premiere, all of these producers, everybody, they were just saying, thank you over and over for being a Christian and coming here. And some of them I've stayed in touch with, uh, you know, on a regular basis. They've asked me to come do other stuff with them and everything. I did feel like there was a bonding. I felt like these are my friends. They're God's friends too. I also think there's going to be a great harvest there. Okay. And that's one of the things I want to talk about tonight is the harvest. But first, I want to talk about someone who I think had one of the greatest ministries of preparing for these times. And that is Bob Jones. You know, since the last time I was here, Bob went on to be with the Lord. And, uh, you know, we did his memorial service. And it was such an amazing thing to see the people came from all over the world to honor Bob, you know, and they were all over the, from all over the world watching on television. And I thought, you know, here's a guy who's never written a book, probably only read two <laughs> besides the Bible. He uh, never pastored a church, never had a television show. I don't think he ever even led a home group. But I don't know of anyone who has so many thousands of people all over the world in their place today, prepared for their purpose in these times, as Bob Jones has been used to get people there. And, uh, but you know, one of his main purposes, he died back in the 70s. He, I mean, he literally died and came before the Lord. And the Lord sent him back and sent him back with a vision for a billion souls coming to him, a billion people. And uh, now, you know, Bob did like a lot of old people do, none of which are in this room, of course, <laughs> but they break a leg or break a hip or something and then just deteriorate and go down really fast. But I learned some really remarkable things about Bob just in those last few weeks. And he lived with us, or close to us, the last 20 years. And uh, so I saw him all the time, almost every week, you know, or, or very regularly. And he had a major, major impact. Uh, you know, I don't even know how we could fathom the impact he had on our, us and our ministry and our families. But, uh, you know, he broke his leg. And as soon as Bonnie, his wife, called me, I said, Bob's broken his leg. I knew this is it. And I'd already told some people, I told Paul Keith and some other people, I felt like this was Bob's last year with us. And uh, anyway, I knew that was it. And he did. He, he uh, went downhill pretty fast. And Ricky Skaggs and I went to see him together just a couple of days before he passed. And then we couldn't get back up there because snowstorms hit Charlotte. And I mean, it was just, they couldn't even get people in and out of the hospital hardly. But uh, Bob, when we saw him, he could not even roll over in bed. He could only say a few words, like two or three at a time. And you had to get right next to his mouth to hear him. I mean, he was a complete invalid. Literally could not roll over, could not lift his head off the pillow. Now, the night he passed, the next morning, you know, I got a text from Bonnie right away after he, he passed. And it was still, we were still just getting 
able to move around because of all the snow in Charlotte. But uh, uh, the hospital administrator called, and he had had the weirdest experience. And let me tell you a little bit. Now, Bob, he, we know physically it's not possible for him to move. This hospital administrator I've known for many years, 25 years maybe. Uh, he loves the Lord. He's a well-known, very respected man, a uh, man of tremendous integrity and honesty. And, uh, but he was really spooked by the prophetic, really spooked by Bob Jones. He believed in it, but didn't want to get anywhere close to it. Now, I felt for years he had the same kind of call on his life. He's running from something, but I'm just saying. So, you know, he is the administrator of the hospital, so he's running doctors and nurses, you know, getting all these four-wheel drive vehicles, schedules just to keep the, the hospital staffed during the snow thing when nobody can get around. And he stayed up like three nights. And uh, he went to his office about three o'clock in the morning and uh, pulls out a little cot or something. He's going to try to grab a few hours of sleep. Lays down and he hears somebody punching the code on his door. And he knows there's only one other person that has that code and they're not there. And the door opens and here walks Bob Jones. <clears throat> now... You know, he's spooked enough, but this is really getting spooky. <laughs> and Robin McMillan had called him to tell him that Bob was in his hospital just so hopefully he would go visit Bob or something, but he took that as a call, stay off of this floor. <laughs> Bob Jones is on this floor. So anyway, Bob comes walking into his office, calls him out by name, says, get a paper and something to write with. I got some words to give you. And he starts dictating. He's, yes, pastor, he calls him Pastor Jones. And uh, he just starts writing. The whole thing's so weird. And he starts giving him words for all kinds of people, just one after the other. And this is a point too. I tell you, until I believe Bob breathed his last breath, he was still thinking about getting people in their place, getting them prepared. And because uh, we had been there with him one night, seven years before, I think, when they told us he had a kidney failure, they said he won't make it through the night. And Bob would not let us go. He kept prophesying, kept, we're writing as fast as we could. Finally, his voice went out. He asked for a pencil and paper. He's still writing the words. Knowing he's going to die the next day, he's not thinking of, die that night. He's not thinking one thing about himself. He's trying to give words to everybody who needs them. Well, he didn't die. We had a miracle. And, uh, but anyway, this last night, he walks into Don's office. And Don said he kept shaking his leg like and saying, I don't understand this. He's got a broken leg. There's no way he could be walking on it. And he couldn't move anyway. He was a total invalid. And, uh, and Don said he had a little blood on his arm. And he said, uh, Pastor... Jones, I've got some gauze here. Let me wipe, wipe that blood off of you. And Bob said, don't touch me. He said, you'll die if you touch me. He said, I haven't been changed yet. That's what he told him. And, uh, but anyway, he gave him a bunch of words and Don's writing as fast as he can. And then he looks down and a whole lot of what he's written looks like it's written in Chinese. And it's perfect Chinese. An artist couldn't do this. And Don doesn't know Chinese. He barely knows English. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't, there's no way. It was supernatural. If you see it, you would know this is supernatural. And, uh, but he was writing in code. And then finally, Bob says, listen, you're not going to be able to get all this. Just quit writing. You will remember these words at the right time. And he just kept on giving him words for people. Then he gave him some more for himself and gave him a command. And then he walked out. 
Don said he sat there for a minute. He must have passed out. He said next thing he knew, he woke up in the morning and he thought this must have been a dream. He thought about everything right away and they said that must have been a dream. Then he looks down there, all these notes, including the Chinese or whatever. That is. So he goes running upstairs to Bob's room and he's already in the body bag. He unzips it just to be sure it's the guy who was in his room last night. And, uh, and then he calls us and we're over there eating breakfast with him early trying to calm him down. And uh, he had a word for a bunch of us, you know, and uh, many more people, he's, he's still getting them, still giving them out. Just a week or so, he remembered another word for me and got it to me. And, uh, but I told him, I said, you're in now. You can't escape this. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no more running from this situation. And uh, that's true, but I think this guy's rising. But the prophetic barometer, I tell you, the prophetic gifting just went up dramatically on everybody. Everybody I know prophetic just went shooting up to another level. And, uh, but I remember at Bob's, <laughs> one of the comments at his memorial service, that I got the most comments back on was when I said, you know, his first meeting I've ever been in when I wasn't afraid of Bob coming up to get the mic. <laughs> but, and then I started thinking, no, nah, I should still be a little bit afraid. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but I know this, it is absolute time to get in your place. We have gotta get in our place, every one of us. We've got to be in God's will. We're not gonna survive the days ahead without being in his will. I mean, being in his will. We've, uh, and that's in every way, but you know, when I was praying about you over here and this meeting, what I should speak about, I felt like I need to speak about the harvest. There's obviously a lot of harvesters here, or a lot of people here who I think are gonna play a great part in the harvest. Now, a lot of things I'm gonna share with you, I wrote from a prophetic experience I, I had in 1987 when I had a two and a half day experience. I saw a panoramic vision of things that would unfold. I think about two thirds to three quarters of which have already happened and the rest are happening. And, uh, but I wanna just talk about the harvest, okay? And maybe tomorrow I'll uh, share some things a little bit more personally. But first let me say, you know, faith in God is different than having faith in an outcome. Do you understand that? I think we're gonna learn that difference. And I think we've tried to build faith on outcomes. This will happen, whatever. And there's something, not saying that's wrong or bad, but faith in God is much more than that. And, uh, but the harvest really is upon us. I know Bob's passing. Some of the things he shared with Mike Bickle years ago when they first met, some of the things he shared all along, his passing marks a whole different change in time. And we're gonna find out when we get, when we're with the Lord, when we come before the Lord, we're all gonna find out who Bob really was for these times. And, uh, but we've gotta get in our place. The harvest is upon us. There's harvesters here. I believe all of us could be here to be a part of it. It is going to be the greatest move of God there's ever been upon the earth. Now, in 1987, I saw two waves of harvest coming. I saw the first one come in be a move of God so great, most people thought this is the end of the age. This is what Jesus said, this is the harvest that was the end of the age. And I believe that wave began in about 1989 or 1990. And you know, we had the greatest in-gathering of souls from 1990 to about, you know, 2012, I mean, 2002, 2005, somewhere in there. 
that uh, there has been on the history of the earth? You know, more people came to the Lord during those years than had come to the Lord from the original day of Pentecost until then. All over the world. Now, a lot of that has to do, there are more people living today on the earth than there was living, than has lived on the earth the entire time up until this day. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the population. But we had an in gathering at that time when it was estimated that somewhere around 375,000 people were coming to Christ every day. We're in a real law right now. And that's what the Lord showed me a time, a period of relative quiet, but between that wave and the next bigger wave, much bigger wave. But uh, we're down right now to only about 220 to 250,000 coming to the Lord every day. You know, Christianity is by far the fastest growing religion in the world. There, uh, but anyway, that was a massive har harvest. Hardly touched America. We got a sprinkle here or there. Hardly touched Western Europe. But in Asia, Africa, South and Central America, I mean, there had never been an end gathering like that in history. And uh, the millions, you know, it started out when everybody was shocked when a million people gathered some of Reinhard Bonnke's crusades. And then that became small. Now there are four to five million people in a single meeting. People walk in two weeks just to get to the service. We won't drive 30 minutes over here. They would walk through the jungle. All those dangers just to get to a meeting where they would stand for hours and hours to hear the word of God but the incredible end gathering. But we are in a time of relative quiet right now. And that's what the Lord showed me. First wave coming, we would think that was the end. That's the, there's never gonna be a greater harvest than that. He said, that was just the end gathering of the laborers for the greatest move of God ever to come upon the earth. And uh, the next big wave is coming. I think it's already imminent. I think it's already coming upon us. I think it's imminent and you can see it in America. Now, the Lord told me it was gonna come like a tsunami. And you know, when a tsunami comes, the waters recede first. That's why they start, they thought, you know, uh, people started walking out. Remember the big tsunami hit a number of years ago, Indonesia and all those, People start walking out on the ocean floor saying, what's going on? Where's the ocean going? Not knowing this is the, the tsunami's coming. Now it looks like Christianity's receding in America right now in a big time. Guess what? <laughs> you better get to the high ground and you better get there fast. Because if you're not on the high ground and we really need to understand what that high ground is, being seated with him in the heavenly places where he is seated, being in his will, abiding in him, we're gonna get washed away with what's coming. But this next tsunami is upon us. I mean, you see incredible miracles like what happened with Phil Robertson and Doug Dynasty. Did you get that? There was such a wave immediately. See, and this guy's just speaking his heart, speaking the truth. Even many in the, the gay community rose up and said, no, he, he should be able to say what he feels. Remember, they were gonna kick him off TV and there was such an uprising, immediately they backed off. And that shows, you know, even though there's not much leadership in America now, the people are ready to rise up in a major way. Uh, on these issues. You're gonna see that rise coming. But the tsunami is about to hit. We've gotta to get to the high ground. We gotta get there fast. I don't care where you are, what you're doing, you better get to your place where you know you're called to be. And you better start doing what you're called to do. We don't have any more time to mess around. So those who are not prepared are gonna be doomed by what's coming.
But I think we're going to see America hit this time, Europe, Russia, China, Middle East. But one of the things we're going to see is the center of gravity for Christianity is going to move to Asia. The Lord showed me that many years ago too. And of course, Americans, we think everything's centered around us. No, it's got to move on to Asia. And uh, it's moved, it's made a circle. It's almost made its way back home. But we're going to see unbelievable in gathering in Asia. What's coming? We're going to see the center of gravity of Christianity shift to Asia from America. Now, really, the center has been all over the world. It's been a while since America's really been the center of gravity for what's the, the cutting edge of Christianity. But that doesn't mean we're not going to enter in, see the end gathering, see greater things than we've ever seen before. But, you know, there's a saying, which I think there's some accuracy to, that in Jerusalem, Christianity became a religion. In Greece, it became a philosophy. In Rome, it became an institution. In Britain, it became a tradition. In America, it became an enterprise. Guess what? Some of that was supposed to happen. The gospel was relative to every culture. All these cultures have something that they have to add that is of their culture and whatever else. But of course, a whole lot of other stuff got added that wasn't the Lord. The reason the Lord showed me the center of gravity was going to move to Asia, he said Asia is going to be a big filter and is going to filter Christianity down to what is truly apostolic, the apostolic faith. All right, so uh, I think a lot of stuff that we built on, the the tr religion, the philosophies, the tradition, the institution, and the business that we've made Christianity in a lot of ways. We're going to see that get filtered out. Okay, I'm just saying. I think then maybe it's going to make its way. It'll go through India and all, but it's going to make its way back to Jerusalem. Now, we may think it's taken 2,000 years just to get this far, how much longer do we have? It can go the next, all the rest of the way in five years. With the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. He can do the rest really quickly. I don't know, but I know this is going to happen. Okay? So, but I want to talk about just a few other details we've got to understand. You know, lawlessness is increasing and it's going to just overflow at the same time. You remember when Joshua crossing the uh, Dead Sea made the, the ark go 2,000 cubits ahead of the people? I think those cubits represented, he said the ark must go about 2,000 cubits. Didn't say exactly, but it's about, I believe that's about 2,000 years. And of course the Dead Sea I mean, it wasn't the, dead, the Jordan River, which empties into the Dead Sea, where they were crossing. Jordan River represents death in Scripture. That's why Jesus baptized there and John baptized there, and it empties into the Dead Sea. It often represents death. They had to cross over death to enter their promised land. Okay, what happened when the priest's feet touched the water? It says in the the waters of the Jordan River were rolled back all the way to Adam. I don't think there's any accident that little city was named Adam. You're going to see death rolled all the way back to Adam. And of course, they crossed over on dry land. And just like they had entered the wilderness. But it said that the Jordan River overflowed its banks all the days of the harvest. Now you can go and read all this in Joshua. These are prophetic statements. We're gonna see death overflowing its banks all the days of the harvest. And we need to start also discerning when major things happen, like that tsunami, you know there has been a major ingathering in Indonesia, you know, since that tsunami hit. Uh, tremendous things have been going on over there. Many other countries where 
all kinds of death and chaos. I tell you, revival is going to win over the death. But, you know, in Psalm 91, where it talks about a thousand may fall on your right, 10,000 on your left, this is going to be literal for some. We've got to learn to keep on functioning with death all around us and living and imparting life that has power over death. Okay, it's going to be some intense times. And if we don't understand that, if you only want to have your ears tickled, you're not gonna make it through what's coming anyway. And that is the condition of much of the body of Christ in America. Can't handle anything negative. Can't handle anything hard. There are even doctrines being promoted in America right now. God doesn't judge anymore since the cross. Well, Jesus himself, contradicted that. How about what he prophesied about Jerusalem? How about everything else he said about the last days and, and the apostles and everything else? It's ridiculous some of the crazy doctrines coming out right now. That, uh, But if you're one of those, you only want to hear what's good, what makes you feel good, you're not going to make it long anyway. You're, not, you're definitely not going to make it through the times ahead. But what did Jesus say we do when he lays out all these earthquakes, famines, wars, all this stuff going on, what is our response? He, what does he tell us to do? Look up. Be happy. Rejoice. Didn't he say that? Look up and rejoice. Your redemption draws near. I tell you, the greatest rejoicing of all is going to come in the darkest of times upon the earth. It's going to be the greatest worship that's going to mean the most to God because of the conditions that it's being offered in. And we're going to see Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, fulfilled. Rise, shine, for your light is coming. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness of people, but his glory will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. The very time darkness is covering the earth and deep darkness of people, the Lord's glory is appearing. And we all want to see his glory. We all want to see miracles. We just don't want to be put in that situation where we've got to have one. <laughs> We're going to be in a situation where we've got to have them. We absolutely have got, we're going to have to live by miracles. We're going to have to live by the power of God. But I tell you, verse three is gonna come true too. The very next verse says, and the nations will come to the brightness of your rising. This is that end gathering. Kings are gonna come. They're gonna bring their sons and daughters. They're gonna bring their wealth. They're gonna bring everything else because they see the glory in the midst of such darkness. What we've gotta to learn to do is look up, not down. You look down, it's not gonna look good. We've got to keep our eyes fixed above on the Lord, who he is, where he sits. And we've got to follow the lamb wherever he goes. But, you know, <clears throat> I'm giving these warnings in pretty relative good times. Relative, I mean, relative aim wars. You know, there's definitely a slide going on. But we're about to see the glory of the Lord. We've got, we're about to see his glory. Like, I don't think it's been shown upon the earth ever before. Even in the first century. They were the seed. We're about to see the, what the harvest. We're about to see all those seeds sprout and come to full maturity. That's what the harvest is. But I tell you, we don't have any time to waste. We don't have a day to waste. Now, you guys coming out on a Friday night like this, you're after God, you're seeking, you're... I know many of you had hard weeks of work and everything. For you to still come out a night like this, you're the ones, you know, you're after God. Don't let up. Don't let up. You know, the Lord, he would send his fire from the ark, from his presence to light the fire on the altar. But then he told the priest to keep it going. He'll light the fires in our life, but he expects us to keep them going. We've got to do that. You know, the Holy Spirit's the helper, not the doer. And he won't get in and help if we're not doing our part. So we've got to do our part. But lawlessness 
is increasing. We're going to see dramatic. To me, this is going to be some of the most difficult things to deal with more than natural disasters, you know, diseases and famines, things like that. It's going to be the lawlessness that breaks out. And there are conditions that are being primed for that. We saw it right away when we went down to Hurricane Katrina to the disaster down there. We set up our base. I mean, the first few days, it was unbelievable. I mean, at first you could tell everybody's just thankful to be alive. Next day, they're really mad because the government wasn't there to bring them their stuff. A couple of days later, they're shooting at people who are trying to bring them stuff. I mean, it got so insane. And I tell you, uh, there's a lot of stuff went on down there. The story has not even been close to fully told. But we went through that down there. We saw it. A lot of our people saw it from the beginning. And when you see that kind of lawlessness, when the martial law came in, when the army finally came, everybody was so happy. I mean, all I can say, you know, thank God for the army. And they straightened things out in a real hurry. And, uh, but then it took a long time to rebuild and all. But things did get rebuilt. They did get restored. But we cannot put our trust. If we've got our trust in the government as our source, you know, and poor people... I tell you, multitudes and multitudes all over the world have been made to trust in governments as their source. And when all of a sudden the government ha cannot come through, they have never learned how to take care of themselves. They've never learned to be resourceful and to, to deal with these situations themselves. And it's going to be pretty intense. What I'm saying right now, we better know the Lord is our source. We better know the Lord is our healer. We better know the Lord in all of his names, all of the ways he has come to be our Lord, which is in every way. We've got to know him as our source and we've got to be seated with him. Now that's more than a doctrine. Everybody knows the doctrine of we're seated with him in heavenly places. You know, I think there's a tiny fraction who, are, who have even experienced that a little bit. We're having taste of it. That high ground we've got to get to, that higher ground, that God's higher way, you know, we've got to get scooting up that thing pretty fast for what's coming. To know him is our source. Will we put him as our trust? He's the one we look to and draw close to and abide in. Right now it seems an option and it is, but if you judge yourselves, you won't have to be judged. We get ourselves ready, we're gonna be ready when things come. Now I know people, of course I get asked a lot, well, should I store food and everything? We, I've been telling our folks for years now, start storing food and other necessary things medicines or whatever, if you need those, whatever you need, start storing it. I'd get rid of the medicine as fast as you can get faith to get healed and I'd start rising up and going after that. But whatever you absolutely have to have, you better be setting it aside. I know a lot of people say, well, the Lord will take care of me. He'll provide everything. And when the Lord's been all along trying to take care of you, to me, it's like that doctrine I think I talked about last time. To me, it's one of the craziest doctrines where you see people get in trouble or get in this massive crisis and they shut down and they use a scripture to shut down with. Stand and see the salvation of God. That is a scripture. He used it twice. About 200 times he made his people fight. So what do we build our, what do we latch on to? Now, if the Lord told you that, do it. You can stand. But if he didn't say it, you never build a doctrine on the exceptions. You build your doctrines on the weight of Scripture 
But understand, then these are principles, not laws. They're exceptions to principles. And God may sometimes say, well, I'll handle this one for you. It's rare. And I see so many people living in defeat because of things like that, wrong theology, bad theology. Of course, that is a scripture, but be sure he told you that before you lean on that. I remember when Jim Baker, any of you watched Jim Baker's show? Yep. You're probably worn out. Have you got your food? <laughs> you know? Now, I love Jim. I think his message is right on. He prophesied the Katrina disaster 60, I think 60 days before it happened. Said, I see a big, is like a, New Orleans becoming like a big lake and all this. Started getting people's attention when that happened. But then he foresaw the tsunami and the quake and tsunami in Japan. It was a couple of months before that happened. Put out a very clear warning. A lot of Japanese people heard that. And we started getting videos back. I'm on Jim's board. So they started getting videos and all of these Japanese people hugging their buckets of food, <laughs> saying all of our neighbors are standing in line eight hours a day. We don't stand in line. We've got our food. I hate lines. That sold me right there. <laughs> so, Jim, give me some buckets of that stuff, man. I'm... <clears throat> no, but think of this. Those people, because they had their food, they could minister to their neighbors. They were reaping a harvest. They were prepared for the harvest. Now, I believe that God, God can multiply food. He may do it that way for you. Just be sure he spoke that. And I tell you, I'd want a signed document from Gabriel. <laughs> or you're going to be hungry. I'm serious. You know, the Holy Spirit is the helper, not the doer. So let's just be sure now. <clears throat> I think, you know, I've been telling our people for years, we've been doing it ourselves. Now, I don't, I don't encourage people to run out and get a year's worth of food right now. I say, every time you go to the store, buy a few extra cans of something, whatever, just build your supply. Now, that's what I started saying years ago. So now we got a pretty good supply. If you're starting this late, you might buy twice as much as you would otherwise. Just let, seek the Lord. Let him lead you, if that's what he's calling you to do. And if he speaks to you, he'll take care of you. Just don't come knocking on my door saying, the Lord told me to come. You're going to take care of me. You're going to be slain in the flesh. <laughs> now, one of the things we started doing was chaplain's training. SISM training, CERT training for all of our pastors and all. Do you know what that is? Crisis intervention, stress management. CERT is community emergency response teams. Now, first time we did it, I knew the Lord said do it. I didn't want to do it. 40 hours in one week of, you know. But I felt like the Lord said do it and you get all of your pastors, everybody who can possibly be here for this. And I was stunned by the first day I immediately said, everybody in Christian ministry should go through this. It is so crucial, so important. Lately, we, last time we partnered with Billy Graham Ministries, they've got an incredible training program. We're doing it with them now, or, or they came over to our place. We're gonna be doing some others. I'd send my key people, send key elders. If you could possibly be there yourself, you're, you're gonna say within the first day or so, I can't believe I've gone this long and not known this stuff. But we have seen so many of our people. Now, one thing, Armageddon can come for your neighbor at the next stoplight. It could be the worst tribulation they ever go through. It could be yours, you and your family. And most people in a crisis situation like that, especially if it's a big crisis like Katrina, they just shut down. They don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. Where do I start? I tell you, this will have you so prepared to be proactive and bring order in the midst of that chaos. I believe it's just essential training. And you're gonna learn some important facts like, you know, I think it's 30 some percent of the time 
that you deliver a death notice to somebody, they respond violently, which is defined going into the next room and getting the gun. That's why police do it now, but police would much rather have a chaplain with them. They don't know how to minister to people, minister to the, they just know to protect themselves from this violent, potentially violent situation. But we've had our people start to connect with police forces like that, become chaplains that way, chaplains of sports teams, hospitals, all kinds of things, where you can start getting plugged in and learning how to deal with emergency situations, crisis and chaotic situations, and start being proactive in the midst of any of this. And it's something, even if we could only do it one evening a week or something, it could change your life as well as many other lives. And this could help get you in the place you're called to be. I think it's one of those major on-ramps where people start getting in some of this very practical training. They're going to start all kinds of other doors are going to open up. So uh, I'd encourage you to do that. I encourage you to um, get in whatever church you have true Kenania some in South, that's Koinonia <laughs> Fellowship. You know, without that, that's the only thing in Scripture says, and I, I know I shared this with you last time. How many of you were here in the last conference? Okay, only a few, so I can say it again anyway. <laughs> but this isn't just my idea. This isn't just my doctrine. The only place in Scripture where it addresses why Christians or weak, or sick, or sleep, or die prematurely is for not having koinonia in their life. And I think there's rare to find koinonia anywhere in the world right now. I think I've only tasted it, begun to taste it. I've had some experiences with it, a little bit in my Christian experience where there was such bonding together in a fellowship, you couldn't be separated. And that's what it means there when you know, many are weak and sick or a number of sleep because they don't discern the Lord's body. They get separated from the body. You cut off a member of your body, it's going to die pretty quick. It's going to get weak and sick and die pretty fast. And uh, that's what hap has happened to many Christians. I think we need a massive home group movement in America. I know uh, years ago, Lord showed Bob Weiner and I he was going to raise up a half million home groups in America where people got saved, they could get delivered, they could get healed, they could be made disciples and not just converts, being established on sound doctrine, where they would start to know their own purpose in the body very fast and start functioning, which is, is going to accelerate right anybody's growth up into the Lord. And that's what we're all trying to do. We've got to have that fellowship. And I don't think we can have it in meetings where we just look at the back of somebody's head once a week or so. You know, we put tables all over our congregation now. Every, it's tables everywhere. We lost a lot of people. They didn't like it. Got them out of their comfort zone. And we were good riddance. We need your seats. Because <laughs> we're going to do this thing. I tell you, within a few weeks, people were getting there early. They were praying for each other, ministering to one another, getting to know each other, little teams. There was bonding going on, starting to experience Koinonia Fellowship. And we're going to go more and more. We're going to go in some Sundays and we're not going to preach. We're not going to worship. We're going to minister to one another. What is this, what is this form of meeting that we have anyway? Where'd that come from? I'm just saying, I'm just asking. Uh, I tell you, the, the emerging generation, not many of them are buying into it. They want the life. They want to, they want to, yeah. churches 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, in the early church, they met from house to house and they met in the temple. They worshiped together and everything, but it, it was, it was daily. It was 
everything. And everybody was constantly in awe of the great things that God was doing. You watch how he shows up in Koinonia Fellowship. And you know that where it says if just two or more gathered? Look up that word gathered. He's not talking about we just get in the same geographical location and hold hands and say we agree together. No, this is where we're knit together. If this would happen with just two or three, we could ask anything and he'll do it. But he, he's not talking about just agree with me, brother. You know, <clears throat> I think we've got to grow up in some of our understanding. The Great Commission is to make disciples, not just converts. I don't think there are more than a handful of true disciples probably in any city in America. Disciple lives every day to be like their master. They wake up thinking of their master. I've got to become like my master and do the works that he did. They live day and night. That's what a disciple, that's what a biblical disciple is. That's what Jesus defined it as. I mean, you just read what Jesus said about his disciples. I think we've been really good at making converts but the Great Commission is to make disciples. And this has got to change. You know, I don't care how long we've been in this thing, time to change. It's time to be a disciple. It's time to live and breathe and have our being in him. There is going to be no other life. Nothing, nothing else that we build upon is going to last that much longer. And I'm not saying quit your job and doing all that. That's a part of it. We've got to learn to function wherever we are. But when he said go into all the world, that wasn't just geographical. I believe he meant go into every job, every profession, everywhere as a missionary. And whatever profession you're in, you've got to be a missionary. You've got to be taking kingdom territory there. You've got to be taking, this is, we've got to go into all of these areas as missionaries. Lord showed me in 1987 churches of 100 people adding 1,000 new believers a week. Doesn't that sound awesome? You don't understand how hard that's going to be. And here was a catcher. I saw a church of 100 people. All of a sudden, they're adding 1,000 every week. And the Lord doesn't want them just herded into big sheep pens where you throw food at them a couple of times a week. He wants them made disciples. He wants them to find their place. He wants them equipped. And, and, you know, as we've got to come to that Ephesians 4 where there's a proper functioning of each individual part. We've got to do this. But then he, what I saw were these mega churches. Where do you think these churches, 15,000, they could handle tens of thousands a week easy. They were adding 100 a week. I said, Lord, what's... He said, they can't handle the growth. They're not prepared. He said, because they built on programs instead of people. And the small churches built on people instead of programs. They built their people. God builds on people. Have you noticed that you can have the best government in the world and have bad government if you've got bad people in it? You can have the greatest church government in the world and have terrible church government if you don't have good people in it. God builds on people, not just systems, not just formulas, not just principles. But are we building our people? Where do you see the saints being equipped like it talks about in Ephesians? Ephesians 4. No, the apostles, prophets. I don't think you are a true biblical apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher if you're not equipping others to do your same job. 
because that's one of the main functions of those ministries, equipping the saints who are supposed to be doing the ministry. Now, meeting like this, which I think has a lot of merit, I think big churches can have a lot of merit, can be used mightily of God. There's certain things you can do in big gatherings, you can't do in small ones. But I tell you, there's a whole lot you can't do in big gatherings, you've got to do in small gatherings. It won't work any other way. It's not going to happen. You've got to have both. You've, you've got to have that place of koinonia fellowship where there's a bonding together. When he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, he wasn't talking about just don't miss the meetings. He's talking about being in, assembled like you would assemble a bike together, the different parts together into a bike. And this thing doesn't work without all the parts. We've got to start doing this. I know the theme of this conference is, are the people prepared? How many of you know your calling and purpose in the Lord? Know your ministry? All right, maybe 15%. That's what it looks like from up here. And you're so hungry, you would come out to a meeting like this on a Friday night. So what is the percentage in the general body of Christ? I mean, you're the hungriest of the hungry that come out to things like this. Where's the whole body of Christ? I think the best you'll find anywhere is 10% of the body functioning. How well would you be doing if 10% of your body was working? Think of the condition of the body of Christ. Where are those apostles? the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers who are equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry until we all was it, come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, he, he wants to be manifested in his fullness in every single body. That's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He says, so, he says the, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you were not lacking in any gift. Christ is fully among you when he can do whatever he wants in this body. When he can do all the things through his body here that he did when he walked the earth personally. That's why every. The koinonia, you will have that. You will have that. What does it say? If we abide in the light as he is in the light, we have koinonia. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we're abiding in the light, we're going to have koinonia. If we don't have that in our life, that bonding together, I tell you, it's closer than our family relationships. Because this is an eternal family relationship. That doesn't mean we should make our family relationships less, but our church relationships should be closer than that. In true koinonia, they are. I remember a church, a little church one time, but it was still, the whole church was thinking about moving to California. So what? Why would you want to do that? Because one of the brothers had heard from God, he's supposed to move to California. They could not imagine, none of them could imagine being separated. So their, their response was, we're supposed to all go. <laughs> That's koinonia, they're touching something. I mean, that was their response. You know, the early church, the heathen, feared the Christians because they could see that koinonia. They could see that there, this is a society like nothing has ever been. I mean, all the nations, where has anything been like this before? The way the Christians, they'd sell all their stuff, pull their stuff to whatever it took. The way they took care of each other and the way they, I mean, they, they stood out so everybody could recognize them. Now, I just want to finish with this. It's gone pretty late already. We're called to be a city. 
set on a hill. What is a city? What is a city? It's a community of communities. Community comes from common unity. Seeing that city is what compelled Abraham to leave the greatest nation on earth. Obviously a member of the aristocracy of the greatest society on earth at the time to wander out into a desert, into a wilderness, not even knowing where he's going because of his vision of that city. He didn't have a Bible. He had a vision. And that vision was so real to him so real to Isaac, so real to Jacob, said they dwelt in tents. Think about that. These guys were unbelievably wealthy. They were so wealthy, they made kings jealous. They could have built probably the best palaces in the world. Nah, tents fine. Because they were not living for the temporary, they were living for eternity. They had a vision of being a part of what God is building, not just man. And they laid everything aside for, to be a part of that vision. I mean, think of it, years of wandering like he did. Do you see his city? What do we have better to do than to be a part of that city? I've got some more to share with you tomorrow. Thank you. All right, let's stand. Tomorrow morning, 10.30, <clears throat> Father, seal by the Holy Spirit your word and words to us today, Lord, both through Bobby, through Rick. Do not, Holy Spirit, we ask, let this simply be a teaching. Go deep within us. Stir us by the Spirit, spirit to spirit, deep within our hearts, our minds. Deeper, deeper, I ask, Holy Spirit. We would volunteer in this hour to be a people made ready by you. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. Open the eyes of our spirit to truly see beyond the temporal. Truly catch a vision of you, Lord, what it is you would do in our time. Grant us that understanding of what it is you would do in our time that we may participate with you in this and what you are doing in this time and have begun to do thus we dedicate ourselves to you Lord for such a time as this you've brought us to the kingdom we say yes to you. In the name of Jesus. We'll see you in the morning. God bless you.